Hello, and thank you for joining us today. The GCLS virtual series welcomes you to the presentation, She and Beyond, Exploring Gender from Femme to Non-Binary. This panel is sponsored by Flashpoint Publications. Flashpoint Publications is happy to announce that we are accepting novel length submissions. We accept stories by and about LGBTQIA people and encourage anyone of any ethnicity to send us a story. Please visit our website, flashpointpublications.com. Flashpoint Publications is a proud sponsor of the GCLS and supporter of their work in creating a more diverse atmosphere within the group and all of our gatherings. Please consider sponsoring them as well. Thanks again to Flashpoint Publications for sponsoring this panel. Now to make this session as interactive as possible, please use the Q&A box to ask questions during the entire session. You are also welcome to chat, but remember to change the to option to everyone. And also please remember the GCLS code of conduct, which you can read more about in the chat and on the GCLS website. So let's get started. We hope that you enjoy this event. I'd like to turn the session over to Rachel Gold. Hey, everybody, welcome. Um, so I'm looking at the names in the attendees panel, and I am loving that I'm seeing some familiar folks. Hi, people that I know. Welcome also to the people that I don't know. Thanks for joining me for this presentation today. Um, so I'm going to get started in a minute and show you a PowerPoint. Um, we may do some other fancy things as well in the online space. But first, I just want to say that I love questions, um, so you are welcome to ask them at any point um, in the chat or in the questions. I will get to them as quickly as I can. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Let's let's go to the PowerPoint. So in thinking about this, you know, I always have the problem that when I'm composing this, I'm kind of in my own head and then I get in a space where I'm talking to you all and I want to make it really relevant. Um, so that's why definitely questions at any point, comments at any point, um, let me know how this is working for you. All right, before I give you the content, what are my qualifications? Why am I the one to talk to you about this? Um, so here we go. I am an author and research nerd. Um, you'll see in the upper right, I am also teaching college these days. Um, so that is a picture of me teaching about fiction. But in addition to writing, I also teach about um, LGBTQ2S literature. Um, the 2S is two-spirit. So I've taught that um, about four times now over the last two years, and that has definitely continued to inform how I think about genders in our communities. Um, and a little bit how I talk about them, uh, we'll find out as we go. You can see some of my books along the bottom there. A number of them deal with gender um, from Being Emily, which is about a trans girl coming out in rural Minnesota, um, to Nico and Tucker, which includes a character um, with an intersex condition. And in the silences, non-binary character. So I do a lot of research for these. So I'm always kind of thinking and talking about this. Um, I myself combine the history of being a lifelong lesbian, still am, and a non-binary person. And we will talk about how those two work together. Um, so today we are mainly going to talk about um, the right side and center of this map. And this, we may actually go live to this map and zoom around it. This is on the site impactprogram.org. Um, it's made with a software called Prezi. So you can, you can zip around and zoom in and out. I can't at the moment, but if you want, we'll go look at it. Um, it's not, this is not a perfect description of the territory um, like, like many maps, but it's a really good way to start to get around. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, first question. Are my books primary young adult, primarily young adults? They are. Um, in fact, they're almost all young adult, except I think one edges into new adult. I really like that young adult space. Um, it's a great place to talk about identity. So it works really well with these kinds of themes. All right, so here we are on, on a map of gender identity and expression, not the map. I don't think there is a the map. Um, and I am primarily interested in the middle and the right side, um, particularly as these pertain to you know, what historically we might call the lesbian community. I'm going to get into terms a lot in a bit, but, but, you know, there is this community that involves lesbians and bisexual women, queer women, um, and now a variety of non-binary people and that community and the way that it can center women and femmes and femininity. It's very interesting to me 
um, the makeup of the community, how it's shifting um, and, and adding people, and eventually what we call it um, or what we could call it. But before I get into all of that, I, I want to be clear about where some of my research interests come from. And to do that, I have to take you back in time uh, to the late 80s in Columbus, Ohio, when I was 17. Uh, that would be 1988. Um, so back then, the, the identity options I knew were lesbian, gay, sometimes bisexual, if you were lucky, woman or man. To the right, you will see the Columbus, Ohio women's football team, the pace setters. And why they're important is that this is how I was getting into the lesbian bar when I was 17. Um, I'd like to add that my parents were not irresponsible. I wasn't drinking. I was just going to hang out with the lesbians. So they were pretty good about letting me go. Um, and historically, a number of the members of the pace setters would help get me past the bouncer <laughs> because the pace setters hung out at Jack's or Summit Station all the time. So if you're looking at this picture, you have a pretty good sense of what my late teen years looked like in terms of community. Very much kind of grew up in this classic, you know, 70s, 80s lesbian community. And I love that community. It was a very helpful community to me as a young person and as an older adult now. Meanwhile, same time, uh, 1995, I met Kate Bornstein. Um, and trans woman activist Debbie Davis, who I spent a lot of time with. And I started to understand that there were a lot more options about gender. I'd kind of known that um, as early as age 15, that, that whatever was going on with me was not well represented <laughs> in the cultural options that I had. But when I started to meet trans women, that's when I was like, oh, like there's something, there's something going on here. There's something about the notion of transgender that's making sense to me. Um, and so at the time I started describing myself as genderqueer, which I still say sometimes. Um, I also now say non-binary because it's just a really great um, umbrella term. And basically my sense of myself um, has really come together in a nice way as having four distinct genders that I blend and move between. Um, as if my, my mind when putting together the map of my body said, we'll just take a little of everything and use it as needed. Um, so, so that's also, in a sense, gender fluid and the ability to move around those genders. Though interestingly, um, although I have different senses of how my body is, I tend to skew actually towards the feminine side, which is why this area of like women, femininity, femmes is particularly compelling to me. So this is also the point where I should say as a disclaimer, I do not have the answers. <laughs> um, I have a lot of ideas, think about this a lot, but I also have a lot of questions for you. So I'm hoping this is a space where you can come through these ideas with me, take what works, play with what you like, tweak it as needed, discard what doesn't work for you, right? I'm not trying to tell you that there's a way to be. Um, you know, I'm going to make a lot of jokes about being non-binary. I don't have to give you one way. Um, that's pretty true. All right, I'm going to pause and peek at my questions while you read the funny parenthetical. Oh, interesting. Okay, so question about um, in terms of posting on Trans Day of Visibility, um, someone saying that she doesn't understand why people choose to change their gender. And that's a great question. And certainly we want to leave a space for people who do experience it as a choice. And there are going to be people who experience it as a choice, but there are a whole lot of people who don't experience it, a it as a choice and actually don't even experience it as a change. Um, for, for a lot of kids, gender is getting wired around age two or three. Like that's when the brain is kind of baking in the gender of your culture. Um, you can think of it a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to switch slides while I say this, just so that I'm not looking at my younger self. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so you can think about, you know, kids age two or three are, are wiring up gender and it's kind of like learning a language, right? Human brains have the capacity to learn language, but we learn a bunch of different languages based on our cultures. And similarly, different cultures do gender in different ways. Um, so human brains are malleable enough that kids at fairly young ages are learning the genders of their culture and learning what their gender is and then wiring it, right? And wiring it onto the body map, et cetera. So you, you, know, you definitely have kids who at a pretty young age go, oh, I, I know I'm a girl and then run into people saying, no, you're a boy, you right? Or the kid says, oh, I know I'm a boy. Um, but runs into people saying you're a girl. And so in that sense, it doesn't even feel like they're changing. 
um, they're actually just bringing their their gender that they have known into the world so that other people can see it. Um, so that's kind of how I would approach things about choice and about change is, yeah, yeah, for some people, sure. But there are plenty of people, you know, we have a lot of data about the depression and the anxiety that sets in when people have to walk around in a gender that doesn't work for them. Um, because gender is so central to who we are culturally and socially, it's really hard to just be adjusting all the time if people are not reacting to you the way that your body mind, the way that your personal map is expecting you to be reacted to. Oh, great question, Cindy. So, so Cindy said, um, a lot of people say women and femmes. Can I explain more what's meant by femmes? And that's perfect that we've switched to this slide because um, this slide will, will show a little bit more about it. So, so generally, the, the more over towards the right side of this you are, the more femme identified you might be. Um, you can see there's a, there a circle for femme itself. But femme, in a broader sense, um, is coming to mean people who may not identify as women, but are still centering femininity, right? So if you have someone who identifies as non-binary, but feminine, um, they might prefer the term femme. So it's a, it's a way to kind of create this community space. Um, and we'll get to this problem in more detail later. That is like, how do we, how do we basically say no cisgender men, like no patriarchy allowed? Um, and women and femmes is one of the ways that people are approaching that and approaching a way that centers um, women, femininity, femmes, and feminism. Okay, I think I've already talked about the fact that I am particularly interested in like the middle to the right side of this map. Um, again, uh, the, the address for this is impactprogram.org uh, and it's gender map is, is what it's under. Um, if you want to go look at it, and if we have time, we'll we'll go around in detail. Um, but my plan next for all of us is to talk a little bit more about um, the notion of categorizing and how sex and gender work. Um, oh, okay, excellent. Where are drag kings? Drag kings are actually over on the left, and in this view, I cut them off. Apologies to drag kings. So there's a whole. Hang on, if I if I pop back a few slides. Oops. Here's the whole map, right? So drag kings are way over here on the left of the entire map. Um, so drag kings are over here, right? Masculinity, men, trans men. Um, and then you have this nice, in this middle section, that shading over where a lot of masculinity is happening, but you have people who might be assigned female at birth, right? Tomboy, boy, butch stud, all of that's happening over here. And then the part that I was showing you all um, is, is kind of just this right side of the map where we're really focusing more on the femininity, some of the non-binary spaces. I wanna describe the problem and the solution at the same time using a really beautiful quote from Joan Roughgarden. So Joan Roughgarden is um, an evolutionary biologist, um, a trans woman, and also a Christian who's written a pretty cool book about that. And so she's thought a lot about how queerness and transness play with evolution, um, with nature, all of this. And in this section that I'm giving you, and I know this is the biggest quote I've got in the presentation, I promise it's not full of big quotes, but this is important. Um, she's talking about the fact that at the time biologists were trying to classify animals, this was when the chemists were making the periodic table of elements, right? So the, the chemists are all like, oh, well, you know, oxygen is always this and hydrogen is always that. And the biologists wanted to be able to do the same, but found that they couldn't. You know, so she's pointing out here, you, you may have a robin in Boston, different from San Francisco's. There are intermediate robins at each gas station along Route 80. So what gets classified? Who is the true robin? What does robin mean? Biological names remain problematic in zoology and botany today. Biologic, biological rainbows interfere with any attempt to stuff living beings into neat categories. Biology doesn't have a periodic table for its species. Organisms flow across the bounds of any category we construct. In biology, nature abhors a category. And yet she goes on to acknowledge a robin is different from a blue jay. So how can we talk about who's the bird feeder, right? The workaround is to collect enough specimens to span the full range of colors in the species rainbow. No single robin models the true robin. All robins are true robins. Every robin has a first class status as a robin. No robin is privileged over others as the exemplar of the species. 
And I think this is really where we are, you know, as a community or communities. Um, and if I, you know, if I go back here, you'll see like we're, we're describing it over in the kind of pink purple area and in the yellow orange area, we are describing a lot of different kinds of robins. Um, but if I go back a little further and we look at the pace setters, like the, that's, this is very much, these are the robins that probably live in San Francisco and they may not be the same robins that live in Boston. So, so historically we've come to a place where we're, having to address this issue that, that Rough Garden talks about, um, that instead of having a single exemplar of who is a lesbian, who is a bi woman, who is a non-binary person, we really have to collect enough specimens that we know the full range of people um, who are around us and that we wanna include in our, in our movement, in our social spaces, et cetera. All right, so sex and gender. Um, if you saw my 2018 presentation, you've seen this, but I just wanna refresh us when I'm talking about sex and gender. And mostly I will talk about them together because we conflate them so often um, that it's kind of pointless to talk about them separately a lot of the time. But if I were defining them separately, I would say that sex is some facts about bodies, right? And gender is what our culture prioritizes and says those facts mean plus your life and your culture and how your culture changes your body, right? So for example, I have both breasts and hands, um, but people don't look at my hands and make decisions about who I am as a person, right? <laughs> Plenty of people go, oh, breasts, like that means the following, you know, a hundred things about me. So, so gender very much um, is not just the fact of like the, the sex version of it would be like, oh, like I have breast tissue that should be checked for breast cancer. My doctor knows I have breasts. We do that. Like that is a sex level conversation about that. And then everything else is the gender level conversation. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of it. And then I also just wanted to show um, now folks are talking more about biopsychosocial models right? Because everything is influencing everything else. So at birth, you're generally deemed a boy or a girl. Um, and then that influences how you're treated and how you're treated impacts how your brain is wired. It doesn't hundred percent determine it, you know, because as I was saying, we could have a young girl who's looking at girls and women and saying, I'm like that, even if her body was assigned male at birth, um, because she's got the kind of body that doctors look at and go, Oh, it's a boy. But you de you, so you're having this, this intense brain wiring um, that's imbibing how your culture is about sex and gender. That can influence how you perceive yourself. How you perceive yourself continues to influence how your brain wires itself. And these just keep interactively creating the person that you are. And then one of the things we don't talk about enough about gender, which I will get in more depth later, is that um, your body changes as you grow, like as you grow in age. And so this process continues. You don't necessarily get just baked and done and you come out of the oven at some point and that's it. And it's particularly interesting to me. I just talked to my old high school a bit ago, you know, and got the question, how do I know what gender I am? Common question. And I'm like, I think you're like 15, 16. Like, should you even know? Um, and not just 15, 16 year olds, you know, you can come into midlife and have that question again, because a lot is happening in midlife. And if you find yourself you know, at that crossroads of like, well, what gender am I or what genders or who, like, how do I want to approach this? I want us to have space throughout the lifespan to have those questions and unpack those questions. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a great comment um, about uh, men presenting with breast cancer. Um, how can you have breast cancer? And interestingly, um, actually all bodies have a prostate. It's just that in cisgender women bodies, it's called the skein's gland. Um, because they couldn't call it the prostate because of course, you know, sex is a binary. So, you know, women can get prostate cancer, but they're not screened for it. And it is more rare, but it's, you know, it's interesting that we're so locked into these two boxes, not overlapping um, that it becomes dangerous for people on a health level because people don't get screened for things that can happen to parts of their body. They actually have. Oh, I'm gonna tell you my other favorite example, um, which actually is osteoporosis. Um, I've seen a couple studies that say that, um, like I always thought osteoporosis was caused by estrogen. 
Um, but actually, you know, like women and cultures that have a lot of physical labor, especially in the past, don't have the same uh, risk of osteoporosis. Um, and I saw a good study of like 6,000 years old skeletons that showed, you know, by, by ages like 60s, 70s, everyone's bone density is pretty similar. Um, so a likely pathway of what's actually causing osteoporosis is that bodies that produce a lot of estrogen develop breasts and bodies with breasts tend to be gendered women. And in our culture, women are told to sit down and be quiet and sitting down and being quiet actually causes osteoporosis, right? Because the, the way to not get osteoporosis is to be physically active um, and have some muscle and have, that's very protective of bone. So it's actually this kind of like biological cultural loop that is causing these impacts on bodies um, it's not the hormone itself. Okay, so there's a lot of ways that we can statistically group humans, right? So, so the classic kind of parts of sex, gender, genes, gonads, genitals, secondary sex characteristics, et cetera. Um, like that's one way to group humans, but there are a lot of other ways. And we use all of these ways um, that I have on this list, you know, some, some horribly, um, some reasonably well, and also that differs culture to culture, right? So just even with age, um, there are cultures that have a, a much greater respect for people as they age. And interestingly, people who tend to be healthier as they age in those cultures, again, showing that culture of biology interplay. So this is, I just want to, I'm breaking down the, the like biological binary here. Um, and this shows, this chart is showing the height and weight of a variety of cisgender men and women. Um, and I'm using it here to illustrate the fact that, that two people who are within one sex gender may be much more different than people from different sexes and genders, right? So you may have like two cisgender women may have radically different heights and body sizes. Um, and one of those women may be very close in size to a cisgender man. Um, and to illustrate that, here are some numbers. Right, so for example, um, I looked up the average NBA and WNBA basketball players, right? And the difference between them is like six to seven inches because you have to be tall to play basketball. And if we look at the average, I should pause here and say, do y'all know what I mean when I say cisgender? Cisgender means you're assigned a gender at birth and you stay in that gender, right? So if the doctor says it's a boy and you're like, yep, I'm a boy slash man. Um, that's cisgender, right? Transgender is the doctor says, oh, it's a boy. And you either say, no, I'm a girl. No, I'm a person. No, I'm gender fluid, right? So that all falls under trans. Um, figured I'd better get that in before I keep going, right? So, so average American cisgender man, cisgender woman, um, they are within five inches of each other, but they're respectively nine and eight inches away from their basketball playing counterparts, Right. So the basketball players have more in common, even though they're different sexes and genders, than the non-basketball players. Um, and then just to give you the most badass example. Um, so this is Sarah Thomas, who holds the record for the fastest four-way swim of the English Channel, four ways. Um, Philip Rush holds the fastest three-way. <laughs> they have more in common than literally everyone else in the world. So again, a place where like sex gender difference is not relevant in this context. What's relevant is they're doing amazing things and are incredible swimmers. But we live in a world where sex and gender are just, they seem so prevalent, right? They just seem, it, well, it's just obvious, right? There's, there's these two boxes and they don't overlap and men suck because patriarchy and that's just how it is. Um, and the chat, the mention of intersex people or people with intersex conditions, about 2% of babies um, are born where the doctor cannot clearly say <laughs> it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, and there are a lot of conditions that don't become visible until puberty um, or until later in life. But it is entirely possible for human bodies to blend the biological characteristics that we think belong in two separate boxes. So... Why do we have this box? So you're going to need my short answer of this. Um, if you need the long answer, email me and I'll give you the long answer. Short answer, um, you know, colonization, colonization, oppression, patriarchy. This is a quote from Oyeronke Oyewumi, 
um, who's done some great work in Yoruban culture and how in Yoruban culture, um, gender just isn't prioritized. I will dramatically read her quote and tell you the rest of this. So she says, I came to realize the fundamental category woman, which is foundational in Western gender discourses, simply did not exist in Yoruba land prior to its sustained contact with the West. Prior to the infusion of Western notions into Yoruba culture, the body was not the basis of social roles, inclusions or exclusions. It was not the foundation of social thought and identity. And she's done a lot of interesting scholarship that points to that age and seniority um, instead were the basis of social roles and that that was determined by a multi-sensory approach anchored in sound, which meant that you would you know, if you were walking into a strange situation, you would hear how people were speaking to each other. And that would tell you the, the age and seniority status and where you fit socially with the other people in that context. Um, so, you know, in short, we have this really binary system um, because patriarchy and because, you know, to control reproduction. Um, I'm not, not going to keep going into that, but I can rant on it if you need to. Right, yeah, you can also attach the gender roles in history to the growth beyond a farming society and creation of industry. Um, thanks, Lynn. And uh, what I've seen actually is that like the beginning of plow agriculture is the beginning of the gender binary. And then as industrialization happens, um, well, like there are kind of waves of more and less rigid binary genders. Our most recent wave was in the 50s after World War II you know, as men come back from the war front and want their jobs back. And so somehow American culture, this is a very American view because I teach American lit. <laughs> Apologies for people in other parts of the world. Um, but, you know, but in America, suddenly hundreds of thousands of women have to be persuaded to go be happy being housewives when they were living in cities, having jobs and probably relationships with each other. So that, that is the most recent kind of lockdown of a binary gender for us. All right, so, so then what happens is, right, and there's a whole bunch that has to do with colonization, um, with racism, with the way race and gender intersect, with the way gender is used by racism. Um, so that is a very rich area, which we may come back to, um, but I would be remiss if I don't mention it here. All right, so that what happens is um, we start to see a really dramatic gender binary, um, thanks to Captain America here, because it's what we're being presented with. So when we look at a lot of media and it's getting better, but I mean, you'll still notice this all the time on your movies and TV. Um, we are being presented with very clear ideals of what is a man's body? What is a woman's body? Who counts as a man? Who counts as a woman? Um, I'm gonna say it is no mistake that almost all of my examples here are white people because that also is held up you know, in Joan Roughgarden's like no single Robin problem, the single Robin of gender is white people. Um, and that's tremendously damaging across the board to um, black, indigenous and people of color and at some level also to white people, but I'm not gonna center that. So we get presented with these visuals. Um, here's, a, here's a screen from The Witcher, like just look, spend a minute and just look at his arm and look at her arm, right? So this is what we're seeing on TV. This, you know, this is what the kids are watching. Um, these are very different bodies that we're looking at. And if you only look at these bodies, you will come away from it thinking, oh yeah, like men and women are really different. You can't go between them. They're two very different things. I know what a man is. I know what a woman is. That's just biology, except that it isn't. Um, so this is Elena Seipel, who is a cisgender woman bodybuilder. And you will notice that her arms are very big, um, much like Geralt's arms and uh, Captain America's arms in the previous photos. So there are definitely you know, women out there who have massive arms who could be cast for these roles and very occasionally are, and it's kind of amazing, but are not routinely cast for those roles. And um, even in places where you're not, you don't have to have a physical human, you almost never see scenes like this in comic books. Um, so this is the fantastic Hulk series that Mariko Tamaki wrote, um, where the Jennifer Walters Hulk actually gets to be called Hulk and not She-Hulk for once. 
So, and, and if you've seen the history of the Jennifer Walters Hulk, um, generally she's drawn very slender. So finally in this series, she gets to have all the muscles um, the way Bruce gets to have all the muscles. And it was really interesting to me about um, this image appearing is how unusual it is <laughs> considering that all comic art is drawn and there could be you know, no dearth of massive women heroes, but we rarely see it because this culture is, is recreating itself. And not only does it recreate itself in terms of human bodies, but also for centuries um, has been recreated in terms of biological science, right? So um, this is from a great book called Queer, A Graphic History um, that is an illustrated history basically of queer studies. I highly recommend it. So up at the top here, you've got your, your representative scientist. You know, the male must be the hunter because he's male. Um, actually not the case with lions. Female lions are the hunters. Um, and then at the bottom, you know, oh, obviously those are hetero, hetero penguins. Um, there are a lot of gay penguins and gay penguins are so effective at being gay penguins um, that they've actually, zoos have given them eggs to raise because two dad penguins will do a good job of raising a little kid. So, so we've lived through a lot of decades and centuries of you know, this monoculture inscribing itself on this massive binary, which then can make us feel very scared about things that disrupt that um, because it seem, it's been naturalized for us. Okay, I just looked at the chat and thank you, Anne. I agree. All right, so, so back to this. So one of my questions for us is like, are human bodies really that different? As we think about um, how does sex and gender work and who, like who gets in our umbrella, um, who gets in our bedrooms, these questions, are our bodies that different? Um, and my answer is yes and no. So, I, and I'm just giving us the, the average weight height chart again to see how much of this is overlapping. So massive, massive overlap between the bodies. Um, I'm gonna show you the overlap. And then I'm gonna show the ways that, that people are different. Oh yeah, good question. How much does our binary gender come with monotheism? <laughs> yeah, I am not, as Laura is saying, I don't, I don't know how many of us are um, really equipped to answer that. That's a great question. I think, I think in a lot of ways they reinscribe each other. Um, though I will say Jewish law has six genders. So it's an interesting question. Okay, so how we're the same. Right, how all human bodies are similar. We are all made of the same parts. This is from Emily Nagoski's great book about sex, um, Come As You Are, recommended. So all made of the same parts. Um, and in each of us, those parts are organized in a unique way that changes over our lifespan. All of that is important. Um, both male and female genitals have a round-ended, highly sensitive, multi-chambered organ to which blood flows during sexual arousal. On females, it's the clitoris. On males, it's the penis. Uh, and each has an organ that is soft, stretchy, stretchy, and grows coarse hair after puberty. On females, it's the outer lips, labia majora. On males, it's the scrotum. These parts don't just look superficially alike. They are developed from the equivalent fetal tissue. Um, now, you probably need help uh, visualizing this. So here you go. So. You can see up at the top is a, a illustration of fetal development at the sexually indifferent stage. And this is color coded, right? So the blue parts are the blue parts going down, the pink parts are the pink parts, the yellow parts are the yellow parts. Um, so if we just follow it, you're like, oh, okay. Like you've got, you've got the genital tubercle, right? Which is gonna turn into the penis and the clitoris, right? You've got the yellow parts that are gonna turn into the scrotum and the labia, um, et cetera, as the body develops. Um, this is also, by the way, when I present this in my class, this is the one of the funnest parts because I just get a whole lot of shock look. Oh, I love these questions. Let me finish, let me fin let me finish genitals. <laughs> we get to the questions. Okay, so you're looking at this with me, right? And you're saying, but okay, here's the thing. Like on the left side at the bottom, there's a lot more blue stuff than there is on the right side. Like you can't tell me that's the same because there is a whole bunch of blue over on the left and there's a little pea-sized dot of blue on the right. To which I say, have you seen the whole clitoris? 
it's massive, right? So the dark pink part on this, hey, this is the entire clitoris diagram, that dark pink part um, would have been all blue on this previous, right? So just look at how much blue there is on the left and then imagine that all of the dark pink here is also that blue. Um, the clitoris is actually, when you include the part that's inside the body, very similar in size to the penis. Um, and it does a lot of the same things in terms of erectile tissue and sensation and all of that. Um, so the everyone's anatomy is actually so much more similar than we were originally taught. Um, and not only does this create problems in terms of things like breast cancer and prostate cancer, um, I read a really funny piece by a urologist who said that she keeps, it's hard for her to teach cisgender men about the muscles in their pelvic floor because they think that only cis women have pelvic floor muscles for having babies. They don't realize that everyone has the same muscles and, and the muscles are capable of doing the same things um, and that everyone needs to exercise these muscles as they age so that you don't pee a little when you laugh. Okay. I'm going to move on to my hormone slide, unless everyone needs another look at this um, and answer some of these questions. Okay, so so Ona, you're asking um, what annoys you most about men must be socialization. Mm, so it's, this is where I get to say yes and no and say a little bit, little bit. Um, I'm I'm going to come back to that because certainly socialization is is a massive input. Um, but here we are on hormones. I'm going to tell you like hormones actually have impact. Um, so hang on a second. I've got a slide for this. Um, and then KG, I like the, took a break from her racist line of questioning to ask, what is a woman? I mean, given that it was a racist line of questioning, I think that a, an answer that talks about the fact that, um, traditionally, um, a lot of harm has been done by placing womanhood and femininity in the camp of white people. Um, and that we like that we need to blow that up, uh, I think that I, I might need more of a context for that. Like if it's, if it's solely about her being racist, then they're like, that's definitely how I would address it. Um, but another set of answers about that is basically a woman is a person who has any of the following, right? The gender identity woman, um, the hormones that we associate with womanhood, um, the genetics that we associate with, you have, you have to combine a number of these, right? You can actually have the genetics and not have the identity. And I would not call that person a woman, right? Um, you can have the hormones and not have the identity. So, so you're, we're kind of looking for, okay, you know, do, do a few of these match up and do we are you prioritizing identity in this? Um, that's a woman. And again, it also depends on the context, right? So, if you're saying the words, what is a woman, but you're, what you're really asking for is who are the people in this room capable of gestating a child, right? Um, like people, people will say women when they don't actually mean all the women. Um, my favorite example of this actually is as a lesbian, I am attracted to women. I am not attracted to all the women, right? I'm mostly attracted to queer women don't really care about straight women. So, so a lot of times we use terms like that really indiscriminately um, when we're actually saying like, oh, can we have a breakout session at this, camp, at this conference for people who can gestate babies and wanna talk about that, right? And there's gonna be a lot of women who are not in that group um, because they have no interest in gestating babies. So I think it's also a call to be really specific about people, what people are saying when they actually say these crazy broad terms. Um, and so now hormones, right? So we just, so bodies, shockingly similar actually. Oh, and a last point about bodies um, is that, I'm gonna go back two slides to show you this again. Um, what's the great news about this is if you are any kind of non-binary or gender queer or just have questions about gender or like, I feel like I'm this gender, but my genitals don't line up with the gender that I feel like I am, they do line up. Like, just let's take a little more time to look at how genitals are actually made when we take them away from what we're taught culturally about them. Anyone's genitals can function like any set of genitals, right? Just because you think you don't have something doesn't mean that your body doesn't have the potential for it. 
um, hormones will actually physically move people across the spectrum of genitals. And, you know, we live in a great time with a lot of technology. There's a lot you can do. So this is my, this is my sex ed minute where I'm like, Hey, if you think your gender and your genitals aren't matching up, like keep, keep working on it. Cause you actually can get there now to talk about some differences, right? So coming in a little bit from the perspective of similarities, um, everyone has all of the things we call sex hormones, right? Our bodies can actually turn testosterone into estrogen. Um, and yet I have come around to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm persuaded from what I've read. There do seem to be impacts in terms of personality, emotions, physicality, et cetera. So to your point, Anna, that um, there may be some hormonal effects going on and, uh, okay, don't look at that one. Let's look at this one to answer the question. So here's a study that's looking at the correlation between masculinity and assertiveness. And I'm also just gonna throw testosterone in there. Um, and you can see that there's like the, the cisgender men over on the right, like that blue is going up, like there's some more assertiveness. And then you've got that giant pink blob at the 25% mark. So how much of this is the effect of testosterone? How much of this is the effect of culture? We don't know. And we also have not entirely figured out how much cultural situations change hormones in the body. Um, testosterone is getting studied now because it actually does seem to change in different situations. So for example, any human at a high level of competition will get a rise in testosterone as they compete, right? Doesn't matter you know, if what if they got ovaries, um, if they've, if, you know, like whatever their gonads are, their testosterone levels are going to rise with competition. Um, so very, very interesting science. And we don't hundred percent know, um, but, but I think it's worth looking at and saying like, okay, there are, there are some effects um, that hormones have on people. Okay. Here's my other cool uh, hormone questions and thoughts. So I'm super curious and I don't think we have the science on this yet. Um, but we definitely have the anecdotes. Trans women often feel much better taking estrogen and trans men feel much better taking testosterone, right? And if you get them in a room, you'll have a, hear a very interesting conversation about trans women saying testosterone is the devil and trans men saying, oh my God, it's amazing. Um, so at my question, like how did they know before starting the hormone that they needed it? Like it's a very interesting interplay of biology and culture um, because how would you know, especially given that testosterone is kind of put out there as this like rage inducing monstrous thing. Um, but a lot of trans men actually say they feel calmer when they take testosterone. So who, who knows? Um, I read a study about cis men having a reduction in depression when they took testosterone, but the study authors found that it was because their brains had turned it into estrogen, right? So it was actually the estrogen that had the antidepressant effect for men, cisgender men. Um, also, anecdotally, there are women at midlife who are prescribed testosterone and feel much better taking it. So it's just like the binary boxes, again, prevent people from using hormones that might be really helpful to them. Um, yeah, okay, so interesting question. Yeah, how much brain chemistry has to do with the hormones? Um, yeah, I, we need more science because that's a great question. Um, and then my last interesting thing that caught my eye, the considered female hormone progesterone that happens in the second half of the menstrual cycle is so good at directing attention, like helping you focus that it's sometimes given to teen boys with ADHD. So, you know, so we, we just think about like, Oh, testosterone is the men's hormone and estrogen is the women's hormone, but it's like, ah, like everyone actually can benefit. Um, and they do have impacts on the body. I mean, this is why, you know, this is why trans women and trans men can transition because all of the parts are there in the body all the time. All the hormone receptors are there all the time. Um, you know, so trans women taking estrogen, their skin will get softer, their hair will get um, lighter. There will be a lot of like, they'll, they will develop breasts because the potential is, was in the body the whole time, you know, and similarly trans men taking testosterone will usually, their clits will get bigger because all that material is there and you give it more of the hormones and it does what it will do in anyone's body. All right, so back to the slide for a minute. Um, 
I'm going to ask this question again later, but I kind of want to ask it here while we're thinking about this, because it's also like, this is my femme centric presentation, right? And so, so I just, when I look at a chart like this, I have a lot of concerns about the fact that um, the people, cisgender men, who are naturally producing high doses of testosterone, which seems to be in general, I've read some other studies, it's associated with assertiveness and confidence, are also the ones who are being told culturally to be assertive and confident. Um, so it's just doubling down on a situation that, you know, makes the kind of people that Ona hates associating with, and sometimes some of the rest of us, um, instead of looking at this and saying, oh, like if we, if we have a group of people who produce a lot of estrogen, um, and maybe like that may be a highly connective hormone, maybe we should give them the assertiveness and confidence and then things would balance out socially a little bit better than if we doubled down on it in the population that already has some of that. Um, okay, so it's also important to remember hormones change over the lifespan, right? So, so from a few weeks after birth to puberty, most kids have the same hormones, right? So, so in terms of hormones influencing the brain, influencing personality and development, that's not actually happening for most of childhood. So what's happening there is probably culture. Um, Fun fact, if you were dividing humans into two groups based solely on the greatest difference in hormones, the groups are pregnant people and everybody else because pregnancy hormones are apparently nuts. Um, and then at midlife, most people start to produce fewer of what's called the sex hormones. Um, blood percentages change and bodies move back toward a middle ground. Um, so for example, this is why cisgender women at midlife might start growing facial hair um, because they're not producing more testosterone, but their estrogen has dropped off. So percentage wise, there's more testosterone available. You know, it's kind of bioavailable in the body. Um, this is also why a lot of times cisgender men's bodies will get softer. Um, and we may see man boobs um, because their testosterone levels are dropping off. And so percentage wise, they're having more estrogen in the blood. Um, and I already mentioned that, you know, we're seeing how cultural and other influences can cause changes in hormone levels. All right. So so what can we take away from all of this? I'm, I'm, before I do that, I'm going to again pause and say, ask all your questions. Um, the folks in charge of this said I'm allowed to run over by like 15 minutes. So I'm totally going to, but get your questions in if you have them. Um, okay, so let's look at sex, sex and gender as a social role, right? Rather than being predominantly biological, right? So again, there are biological influences that nudge things certain ways. Um, but a lot of times how we're doing sex gender is we're expressing our identity, we're expressing a social role or roles. And culturally, we understand um, that social and legal identity or role has to be more important than biological traits, right? This is a family with an adopted daughter. Um, and it's a real family, even though they're not a biological family. And you would have to be a complete asshole to go tell this kid that she's not really their kid because we understand she really is their kid. Like we humans live in a world mediated by culture, right? We don't live in a purely biological world. So culture has to be important. Um, and we already know how to do this. So this is what's really interesting um, to me is that I think like in a lot of conversations, particularly about transgender genders, um, there's a lot of freaking out as if we don't actually already possess the skills to do this. Um, but we do possess the skills to do this because we do it all the time, right? We understand, we understand what adoption is. We understand that people change their names sometimes when they marry and that we're just going to use the new name and no one protests using the new name. So we already have all the tools that we need to navigate the changes that are now coming in terms of gender, right? And um, we also, we have a really great understanding already that some people are gonna change their identities and roles, and some people are gonna have a fixed identity or role for their entire lives, right? So for example, I'm gonna pick being a kid because you start out being a kid when you're born, right? So you've got a lot of people who they're, they're born as a child and they're gonna be someone's child for the rest of their lives, right? They have a good relationship with their parents. That's a core part of their identity. It's a fixed identity. I am so-and-so's kid, fixed identity for their entire life. Just like some people are a woman for their entire life. 
Um, you have other people, maybe born into very dysfunctional families, who say, no, thank you, and leave and give up that identity and no longer walk around in the world as someone's kid, right? Their other identities come to the fore. So, so in that sense, like we, and we respect that. Like if someone says to you, oh, like I cut off my parents 20 years ago, I'm never speaking to them again. We respect that, right? We, we don't say like, but your identity is a child. Well, sometimes people are a little iffy, but we know how to respect it. I will put that in there. We may have opinions, but we know how to respect it. Um, and so professions and callings, right? I think we all know people for whom like their profession is a calling and that's something they're gonna be for the rest of their lives, whether they're actively working or not. Um, I'm going to give the example of my dad, um, who, you know, just retired a few years ago after being a professor for, I don't know, longer than I've been alive, I think, many decades. Um, and he will still, you know, like he'll show, still show up as a professor if you need a, if you need a math professor to explain math, um, because that's just part of who he is. That's part of his core identity. That's part of his role in the world is to be the professor. Um, and then some people change identities. I spent my early formative years in Ohio, but I am definitely a Minnesotan. I have I've transitioned from Ohio to Minnesota. Been here a lot longer too, and I love Minnesota. So, so all of these are places where we understand, oh, right, like this is part of who you are, and then sometimes part of who you are changes, and sometimes it doesn't, and we're okay with that. We just suddenly become really unokay sometimes when it's about gender. Um, for a lot of reasons, it can it can feel really scary because, um, and I'm going to say particularly like in a lesbian, bi, queer women, gay girl context, um, that fixed identity felt so safe, um, especially during past embattled decades. Right when patriarchy is coming down on the lesbians, banding together as lesbians feels really safe. So then when we wake up into a world where we're like, wait, 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 there are people like this person was a lesbian and now they're not like, what does that even mean? That feels really unsafe to me. That's, that's all legitimate. Like I want to put that all in the space because that's all like that happens. And it's important to understand how and why it happens. Um, it's important to understand when we get scared about something and then figure out the actions we want to take rather than being reactionary about it. Okay. A few more slides about gender. Uh, then I think I've got some questions for you all. Different studies, like some strict studies, three to 5% of people identify as non-binary. Big study in Israel, um, Daphne Joel is the author. Um, over 35% of the people felt that they were to some extent the other gender, both genders, or neither gender. That gives you a range, like how many people are actually non-binary, somewhere between three and 35% of people. So there's, there's a lot of space to play with. Oh, yes. And excellent. Like the safety, uh, identity is safety. Thank you for bringing up um, kind of like PTSD. I don't know that I'm qualified to, to diagnose that, but I think it's very, it, it is very much that in the identity politics in general of the queer movement, right? Like identity was just so formative in past decades and so important and so much work got done having fixed identities um, that it can feel very scary to be in a world where suddenly there are much fewer fixed identities. Okay, so I propose, uh, at least in our brains, a three gender system um, where you just add another box. This is my simple system for walking around in a diverse gendered world without losing your mind, um, which is you just like, you, you know who women are, you know who men are, right? So you just keep those boxes. We just make sure that trans women go in women and trans men go in men. Um, and then you just make a people box and you default to they, them pronouns in your people box because I've never seen anyone be upset using they, them pronouns. And the cool thing that I'm seeing these days with the students um, is that they will actually default to they, them as a sign of respect, right? So like if they, like if I have a guest author visit the class and they don't know that author's pronouns, instead of assuming they will start with they, them until they know that person's pronouns. So, so it's really, um, kind of become a mark of just giving a lot of space to people for them to identify themselves. Um, and then I didn't, I didn't do slides in this presentation for, you know, two-spirit Asegi, which is a Cherokee term, Hijra, Toms and Ds from Thailand, Fa'afafine from um, Samoa. There are so many genders. You can actually Google it. Like if you Google genders of the world, people have put together maps now that just have like dozens of pins across the world of different gender systems. 
Um, so I just want to put this here to say, like, remember that, that culturally there are many, many gender systems. So we want to kind of be wise and create space and listen for um, what people's genders are. Okay. All right. Terms and invitations. Look, so let's play with some things. Okay. I'm coming back to our, our map here for a minute. There's a lot of stuff on this map, and this isn't even all the genders. Um, I was debating if I was going to run down a list in this presentation, but I didn't want to take up too much time with that. But Google it. There's so much cool stuff. And then I just want to encourage you can mix and match and play with stuff. Like you don't have to be in the gender fluid circle to do that. Um, like as I was talking about identities and social roles and the and the, the ones that we have, you know, like being a kid or being a parent, et cetera. You can also see that you already know how to be multiple social roles in different situations. So you can actually play with multiple genders. Um, okay, can I talk to uh, trans women not allowed to compete in school sports argument? Yes, yes I can. Um, but there's actually a great book. There's a chapter in a, the book Beyond Trans that does a much better job than I'm about to do. So if you need the detailed argument, um, go to the book Beyond Trans. Um, I think it's Heath Fogg Davis is the author. Um, and basically you've got two things, right? So part one is like at the recreational level, there, there are more important things than gender in terms of competition. And the, the one that comes immediately to mind is weight class, right? So there are a lot of sports where your size and your weight and your overall athletic ability is much more important than your sex slash gender. Um, so that's a place where you can actually create teams that way instead of just being like, we're gonna put all the, you know, like we're gonna put these people together and these people together. And also, I mean, especially like a trans girl who's, you know, doing high school sports, et cetera, especially if she's on estrogen benefits, I'm making big quote marks with my fingers, but like any muscle gain that came from testosterone actually drops off pretty quickly. Um, so, for, so if you're not operating at the highest level of sport, it's pretty easy to just be like, okay, like if you're doing boys and girls teams, trans girls go on the girl team. Do you need to do boys and girls teams? You maybe don't. Maybe you need to do one team that's like the big athletic kids and one team that's the small, less athletic kids, right? So, so that's a way to think about it in that setting. Um, and then I'm just going to mention like in the Olympics, the intersection of racism and uh, misogyny that is happening with athletes is intense. Um, and the, the, yeah. Um, if you're curious about that, I'm just going to say, Google it, Google the like black women athletes who are being tested for testosterone in the Olympics. There are a lot of good pieces on it. Um, I'm hoping that we get to a place with a better resolution than we've got right now for it. And that people get all the racist parts of that as well. Um, so that's a whole different problem. Um, but hopefully I've answered your question well enough. Okay. All right. So, um, so I just, I wanted to kind of end this with some opportunities. So number one, I encourage you to play with gender and here are some questions and I'll, um, I can make this PowerPoint available to folks who want to download it and think about these questions in more detail, you know, but just play with it. Like, are, like, are there characters that you're drawn to? Is that a gender? Do you want to just try it on? Um, do you experience gender envy when and why? Uh, make up genders that have nothing to do with women and men. Like the one, my one critique of the map that I've been showing you about the genders um, is that it's very, it's still very binary in having masculine on one side and feminine on the other. Um, even though they put the non-binary in the middle, I just want some other genders like off to the side that are like, you know, sparkle hands. If you want a challenge level, think about somebody who embodies a gender you feel no connection to and what might they love about their gender? Like what might it feel to walk around as them? If you could be any sex or gender for a day, what would you be? And then what would you be the next day, right? You don't have to, you don't have to stick as one. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing in the chat, Tasha, Ona's friend, um, trans as an umbrella term for anyone who does not identify with the gender assigned at birth exactly. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say binary trans, by which they mean um, people who were assigned male and are female, people who were assigned female are male. Um, so trans women, trans men, binary trans, and some people will say non-binary trans for everyone else who is like, no, that box is not me. 
All right. Um, remember that gender can be contextual and it can change over time. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, attendee who said I'm a woman and somewhat butch and I object to my butchness being put on the male side. Yes, I salute you. Um, agree. Uh, feel free to tell us where you would put it. I also want to say that one of the one of the things that I've been thinking about that I really don't have answers for, but I'm working on in my brain is like, what does it mean to have maleness without masculinity? Right. Because there are qualities of maleness that are very interesting, but I personally am not that interested in masculinity and what happens when you disconnect the two. Um, I don't have the answer to that. Check back in in a year or two. I'll see what, I'll see what I've got. Okay. And then what about butch femme, not the roles, but the identity femme identity, but I'm a cis woman. I mean, my answer is fantastic. <laughs> I, I think that like femme as an identity has so many, um, so many access points, you know, and, and in a way, and feel free to speak to this more Ona, also, cause I don't want to talk for you, but, but, you know, that centering of femininity, that centering of, of all the beautiful femme things. Excellent. Yes. Okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more from butch woman. I think the makers of that map, if I may try to read their minds, um, we're saying that butch in a sense is aspects of masculinity applied to woman. Um, yeah, I love this. I love this. Um, I am not disagreeing with any of you. I'm just, uh, trying to explain the map. Yeah. Masculine, but not male. Right. So okay, good. Keep going people. This is, I wanted to do some brainstorming and playing in this part. Because that's the thing is like now that the doors are open, there are just so many cool ways to approach this. Um, and we get masculine, but not male or male, but not masculine or like butch lesbian is very much a woman. And the quality of butchness is not a quality of masculinity. If you want to play with the fact that gender can be contextual and change over time, really look at, do you have different genders in different places in time? Can you shift them consciously or do they shift when you go different places? Um, so for me, for example, since I use both they, them and she, her pronouns, I actually much prefer my she, her pronouns in like lesbian, bi, queer, sapphic environments, um, because in those environments, what a woman can be feels to me vast, right? And so then I fit into she, her a lot better than in, for example, corporate America, where what she, her means in corporate America is not what I am, right? So then I would prefer they, them, because that's what I am in that context. So that's a thing to play with. Um, and then how has your gender changed or remains fixed across your life? Because as you grow, as you learn things, as your hormones change, you may have different experiences of gender. Yeah, okay, so yes, male side pisses me off because of the patriarchy. Yes, exactly, not like a man at all. Yeah, I think we should open up some other space. I mean, I don't know what you wanna call that, but I'm for that space. Like, what is that space of butch lesbian um, that, is, that is not masculine? I, I will welcome all the answers. Um, okay, some more questions, uh, community opportunities. So if we accept that today's mainstream fixed genders, the binary come out of patriarchy, colonization and oppression, and if we've created powerful fixed identities to fight that, how do we create space for new genders, right? So, so if we look back, let's look back to say, I don't know, 50s, 60s, 70s, right? Patriarchy is a whole bunch of crap. So we create these powerful fixed identities, right? I'm a lesbian, I'm a lesbian my whole life. It means this. And, and that's an antidote to that oppression. But then it locks us into this fixed identity. How can we honor those fixed identities and still create space for the new genders that are happening, right? So here are some ideas, but like I, I'm asking you all this because I don't have all the answers. So some of my thoughts are, we got to make sure we keep honoring the bravery and contributions of lesbians, bi and queer women, gay girls. Um, remember Audre Lorde tells us in the 50s, like her group were the gay girls. So honor all, all of the people, you know, all the, to go back to Joan Roughgarden, all the examples, uh, you know, of what a lesbian, bi, queer woman, gay girl can be um, and honor how they got us to where we are today. Um, we have to keep it intersectional. We have to remember there's no single true Robin. There's not even like six of them. Um, so we have to keep looking across race and class and ability and neurodiversity and understand how that's all working together. Um, and then explore the kinds of language that honor and respect our differences and our similarities. 
um, and appreciate the work that's happening to create new gender options. Like, you know, what are the kids up to? Okay, I don't know how to make a, a word map, but Anne, if you know how to make a word map, make a word map. Um, or tell me what to do so that I can make a word map. Um, and then, so this is, uh, as I get to wrapping up, um, like I, I'm asking, like, what, what language will we use? And this, some, this is just, I asked my class last semester, like, what would you call this group? And no cis guys allowed was actually one of the first ones. It was just like, no, like, no guys, no patriarchy, trans guys, sure, depending. Um, queer gals and pals was actually kind of the winner. I'm seeing more and more sapphic as the umbrella term, um, you know, and then we're also seeing like lesbian, queer, bi women and femmes to that question of like, when we say like women and femmes, what are we saying? No cis guys, can y'all just figure out a way to say no cis guys allowed that it like sounds poetic, please for me, that would be great. So this is my same intro question, um, but just other stuff to think about. How does your identity shift if your partner or partners change or add genders? Um, and are there places where you fear that your gender, sexual orientation, or political power is discredited by other people's actions around gender? How can you hold that power regardless of what other people do? Right. So the classic example of this is like, like I went to college with a bunch of lesbians, and then one of them married a man. And then like, do the rest of us all go, oh my God, what does this mean about us? Like, could this happen to us? That would be terrible. And then I just have to take a minute and breathe and be like, pretty sure that's never going to happen to me. Like, just going to get back to a place of safety on that. So, so let's look at some ways that, that we hold and we stay rooted in our, our power, our identity, our social roles, regardless of what other people do. Okay, so here's my thank you slide. And I'm going to, okay, there's the gender map. Uh, it's a few years old, so it's a little... It's a little outdated, but it's not bad. Um, all right, here's my smiling face. If you, I don't know if you can see it while I'm screen sharing. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm basically ritualgold.com pretty much everywhere. And I'm gonna stop sharing so I can smile at you all for a minute. Okay, hello people. We have like five-ish minutes left. Um, what other questions or thoughts? Or Anne, did you start the word map? How does the word map work? Okay, you probably can't answer that because you're, you're stuck in the attendee slot. So I'm just going to say, if, if folks are um, creating social spaces um, where we figure out how to talk about this stuff more, I am for it. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we're at a time and we're in a situation where there is, there's a lot of really righteous fear. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of reasons for people to be afraid, but we also have this massive, beautiful, powerful community and the more we can think about how to language everything um, and respect and honor everyone and honor historically what people have done, you know, because because one of my things is like, you know, like I, I said, I grew up with lesbians. I grew up with historically the, the importance of the role um, that lesbians have played in the movement. So it's like we're not I hope no one's trying to decenter that. I don't think we're trying to decenter that. I think it's just that, you know, we want this giant, beautiful coalition of people and need to find more and more ways to talk about it and some great way to say no cis guys um, so that we can invite everybody else to the party. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, if you're all doing a thing, just tweet me or email me. And if I can, I will, if I'm not swamped with grading, I will show up and, uh, and continue to help figure this out. All right. Well, I think, I think that's it for me. I mean, I feel like I've passed it on. So now I've given a little bit of homework. Let me know how it turns out. You all get A's and, uh, you know, just check in with me later. And great to see you all. I hope to see some folks at GCLS. So I'm looking forward to someday having an in-person event with people. <laughs> I hope you're all doing well. Thank you so much, Rachel. We really appreciate you being here. It was a wonderfully insightful presentation. And thank you everyone else for being here too. We really appreciate your support. Stay tuned for future virtual sessions. This is being recorded. So tomorrow it should be on our YouTube channel. So you can look back at it and, and take more notes. It was really insightful. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Take care. Bye.